Hello, everyone. This is a very special episode of the Troublesome Turfs. We call it a public service podcast. Um, and the reason we do this is because there have been some very interesting um, developments in the world of interpreting and the world of politics, and the two worlds have overlapped once more. So you've probably uh, seen the news about uh, President Trump visiting uh, Helsinki to talk to uh, President Putin. And for a long time in the run-up to the meeting, um, they said that there, there would not be anybody in the room besides the two uh, principals, so there would not be any note-takers, uh, no translators or interpreters. But it turns out there apparently was one interpreter in the room because uh, just today or yesterday, um, uh, a, an American representative, an American senator, um, suggested that the interpreter be put under a subpoena and be questions ab uh, questioned about what went on in the meeting. Because as you have certainly seen, um, that meeting and especially the press conference afterwards caused quite a quite a bit of a, a turmoil in in um, international politics. So that's why we wanted to take that topic or take that development uh, as a topic for this little video segment to just um, talk about what happened and um, what the implications could be. And we just want to look at this from an interpreting point of view, not so much from a political point of view, and we don't want to make any judgments um, about what should be done or what um, shouldn't be done. And I think it's a good fit for us as well, because in, in many of our podcasts, we have talked about sort of traditional concepts about interpreting like neutrality and the neutral conduit for the interpreter and how that maybe doesn't really make sense. Um, so, gentlemen, what's what's your take on the whole situation? I mean, you've you've probably seen um, the news, and you may have seen some reactions. Was there anything that was kind of striking to you there? Yeah, I actually felt like this was a really interesting uh, development. I would say, for one, obviously, because yet again, an interpreter is in the news for a less than an ideal circumstance. It's kind of usually the only time that we find interpreters in the news is when some stuff happens. Just for different um, reasons, right? <laughs> just for different, yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, I, I think this is putting it on a, or us or our profession on a, on a quite a slippery slope should this go through just because confidentiality is one of the major cornerstones. It's kind of like a golden rule of interpreting um, in that it's essential for us because we need to create trust for the users of our service because oftentimes we are in a, by definition, the dialogue situation that we're in is rather imbalanced because we're oftentimes the only people in the conversation actually understanding both sides. So we really need to create the trust on both sides that we will deliver what person A said to person B and vice versa because otherwise, why even bother if no one believes in what we say? then, you know, might as well not even be there. So I think by um, kind of undermining that principle, that's quite quite a slippery slope. I think it's, on the one hand, it's an admission that the presence of an interpreter changes the situation entirely. And it's something that, that I very much believe in, is that we can't pretend that a situation with an interpreter is exactly the same as a situation without one. That's just not true. On the other hand, I would say that we have to realize that whenever we're in an interpreted situation, we're there as a privileged person. And that privilege comes with certain requirements, certain ethical requirements, certain legal requirements even. And in this particular case, I think it was Kevin Hensel who pointed out on Twitter that no matter what we say about interpreters' own codes of conduct and secrecy and confidentiality, the fact is that this interpreter was dealing with classified information. And so it's almost not an interpreting issue anymore. It's a question of what you do with classified information. And the, the rules on that in every single country are pretty much the same. You know, if you come across classified information, if you're a party, sorry, to classified information, you may not reveal that to anyone. Um, so it, it's up to Congress what they do, but the interpreter will probably be restricted in what she can and cannot say. And that's leaving aside the, the well-known effect in interpreting that her job was so stressful that we rarely remember all of the details of an event. And, you know, I'm, I, I can't be the only interpreter who looks at my consec notes after I've done consec and goes, well, even if I don't destroy those, no one would know what they meant anyway, but I'll destroy them just in case. Yeah. Um, well, that's actually the big issue that, that I saw in, in this whole situation, because um, as far as I know, this meeting lasted, I think, more than two hours. 
Um, I suppose that Trump used interpretation because he doesn't speak Russian uh, as far as I know. And while Putin speaks a bit of English, he usually works with an interpreter as well. Um, and so they both have, you know, real excellent uh, interpreters available to them. But but to your point, that, that was really what, what struck me because... Um, a colleague will have done either uh, consecutive interpreting, but maybe even shushotage where you don't take notes, where you really just uh, interpret simultaneously uh, and you whisper into the principal's ear. Um, so, you know, I, I would be quite hard pressed as well to remember any information from a given meeting, especially when you add to the normal stress of interpreting for heads of state and government at a high level, when you add to that the, the particular sort of difficult situation of this meeting with Trump and Putin, given all the hiccup that was going on before and, and the huge international attention that was focused on this meeting, although it took um, place behind closed doors, uh, of course. Yeah, and, and as far as we know, the, the colleague in question is a staff interpreter with the US government, with the Secretary um, the Department of State, I suppose. So she will be bound by not only the usual rules of, of an interpreter about professional secrecy and confidentiality, but also by other rules that are in place um, for this for this kind of work. So it's it's going to be a, a tough call, uh, I think, to some extent as well. Yeah. I, I would say that there's a good chance that she was using some form of uh, bilateral consecutive or dialogue interpreting. And my experience of that is that your situational awareness is so key there that if someone were to ask you, you know, what did someone say at a given point, the likelihood is you don't remember. Um, can I just say, be before we go any further, I have the utmost respect. Um, and I think we all need to say that the interpreters who take on these kind of jobs, I have the utmost respect for them. They do an incredible job. They're incredibly well trained. And as a fellow interpreter, I I feel uncomfortable with a fellow interpreter being through being given such a put under such pressure. Yeah. Um, it, again, I have to say again, it's up to Congress what they do. Um, but can I just say my heart really goes out to her because no matter what happens now, her name is always going to be tied to this moment in history. And because of what she's bound to, she will never be able to have her say publicly. She will never be able to have a right to reply. And, and, th and that's, that's quite sad. And she didn't do. She didn't even do anything wrong. She she was yeah. just put into that. She situation. did her job, and, yeah. and now she has to deal with it, which uh, often happens to interpreters. You know, we get blamed for all kinds of things. You know, from misunderstandings to whatever. But mm. it, this is really a very very difficult situation to be in. Yeah. But Alex, you know, you, I've, you I've, I've, yeah, I was just want to. I just wanted to say because um, she's kind of stuck in a you know between a rock and a hard place, and I'm wondering what they would like to get out of this. I mean, I guess everybody is kind of in it for like the gossipy element of it all, like what actually happened between Trump and Putin, you know, this kind of like the story of, I guess, depending on who you ask, it's a bigger story or sometimes not so big. But I think um, no matter what she says, if she actually says anything or if she's forced to say anything, I wonder how productive any of that is actually going to be because, um, you know, let's say, she says Trump did A, then Trump just goes out and says, no, I didn't, she's lying, I did B, she's ruined. If she doesn't say anything, if she actually chooses to, um, you know, withhold her testimony, she's also in a very tough place. And, you know, even if, let's say she says anything else, and then Putin can say, oh, no, that's also not true. So she's just in a very, very... Um, yeah, unfortunate situation in this at this moment in time. So I really hope that it actually doesn't come to uh, to the moment where they force her to disclose any confidential information to the public. I mean, even in the past when they did interview the former uh, head of the FBI, James Comey, they he did the public testimony where oftentimes he said that he cannot reveal information because it either pertained to an ongoing investigation because it was crucial for matters of national security or because they were simply confidential. But he did disclose a lot of that, if not all of that, I'm not quite sure, in a um, behind closed doors meeting with the appropriate um, bodies of the U.S. government. So I'm thinking that might actually be a, a way that they could go um, which would also help our colleague in a way to save face because it, in that way it's much less salacious and it kind of like goes through the proper channels that such things could go through if they needed to. Yeah. And I just yeah. hope they don't just, you know, go for the gossip route and just try to milk it and her in the situation for, for all the headlines they can get out of it. 
I, I, it reminds me of how vulnerable we are as interpreters. Um, I'm a big one for talking about the power, the potential and the power of interpreting, and it's important. But I think we forget too often about the vulnerability of interpreters and the fact that we already have a lot of jobs to do. Um, I would be uncomfortable with a world in a world where interpreters are suddenly expected to also be those who would give a report on the event or be, be in a position to give a report on an event. I would be very uncomfortable for that to be added to our workload. Um, but yeah, I, but yeah, I also know I'm a, and I'm also aware, having interpreted at enough political and business events, that the interpreter is, in many cases, a pawn. Um, every interpreter that I've spoken to so far, when I talk about what I call symbolic interpreting, where we're there because it's politically astute for us to be there, even though we're not really needed. Every interpreter I've spoken to, every conference interpreter I've spoken to, said, "Yeah, I've been there." You know, we've all been in the booth where we're interpreting and realise that no one's got a headset on, but, you know, we don't stop doing our job. Um, there is something about the symbolism of having an interpreter present and the choice, and let's face it, it is, it is always a free choice to have interpreters present or not. There is something about making that choice and us being there, which means that whether we like it or not and whether we find it ethical or not, we are symbols and pawns in a bigger game. Um, and perhaps the best thing that can come out of this for the interpreting profession is to face that down once again and when we're training interpreters and when we're supporting each other to have that in mind um, my criticism I still have a, a criticism of the profession that we concentrate so much on what we would call accuracy and quality and perhaps not enough on the fact that we are in a situation not of our own making and we're there for a purpose that may not be disclosed to us. It's very clear that this request for a subpoena is not something that the interpreter is in control of, is done for purposes that she is not party to. And sadly, that is part of what it means to be an interpreter too, especially in conference interpreting. Possibly our colleagues in public service interpreting and community interpreting could tell us stories of, of being in that place as well. Mm -hmm. Perhaps we don't recognize that reality enough. Mm, I, I very think true. The, the term pawn is, is sadly very accurate in, in that um, situation, I think. And, and it shows that um, very often the, the, the role of the interpreter is basically misunderstood um, because, you know, sometimes it happens that you interpret and you're asked, well, can we record the interpreting? So we have a multilingual, you know, we have multilingual minutes or proceedings uh, of a certain event, which is not really the point of interpreting um, because it's very much intended to be used in the moment to, to enable communication. Um, and interpreters are not note takers. Interpreters are not observers. Um, they have a very specific role. So it's, it's really kind of sad to see that um, this is kind of either willfully ignored or that maybe the, the situation is, is misunderstood. And it's particularly sad i think that it happens in this very difficult uh situation of you know the difficult overall political context that we have in the u.s um and, and the whole international conflict with russia and the u.s so uh, i think if, if we can draw any conclusions from this it will probably be that we stand in solidarity yeah. with our with our colleague and that all we all we can do is basically try to explain a little bit what interpreting is what an interpreter does and and why this whole idea is is a, at least problematic. Yeah, but I actually think, um, you know, to look at the bright side of it all, um, there's a lot of discussion currently going on on social media, on Twitter, on Facebook. Um, the professional associations have already partially reacted. Uh, Germany, for example, has said that they will react. Um, Feet has posted about it. And I read on, on Twitter that one of the uh, vice presidents of Aiki Manu, he was saying that, um, you know, we stand in solidarity with our colleague, but at the same time that this is actually an opportunity, and I agree with him what he said, that this is an opportunity to present a united front as a profession, to point out the qualities that we do represent, like confidentiality, like that, you know, like the fact that people can trust us, the people that use our service, they can trust us to perform this service dutifully. Yeah. And um, I think this is, could be an opportunity because at the moment the spotlight is very much on this discussion that people are having like what can you do what shouldn't you do how should you behave and i think that also presents an opportunity 
Hmm. It, it's a wonderful opportunity for us to state what we do, and as much as I don't like going down this route, what we don't do. Yeah. Um, I would be keen, however, um, to actually have the most key professional associations really take the lead. And I think there could be danger if too many associations from too many countries come in with a statement. Um, certainly IEC, ATA, FIT, they're very well positioned to speak authoritatively on this yeah. and as those whose constituency it, it affects. Um, it's easier to have a united front when you have a limited number of spokespeople that you say, this is your thing and we support you to do that. Yeah. Um, I think that that's a wonderful thing to to. It's not kind of let them go and do it because we don't want to, but to let them go and make the statements, let people go on air. It was lovely to see a Judy Jenner, who is one of the best people to to do this kind of work, <laughs> be interviewed by Jake, uh, Jake Tapper. Mm. Let let the people who have that job do that job. Support them however they want to support, and maybe just having three or four associations take the lead and the rest just kind of stand in the back and nod is the best for us to do. Yeah. Um, this is, I can't see this story being one that's going to take months and months, although you never know with the US political cycle. But it is a wonderful opportunity to say what we do. And it's just like we had recently in the UK, the Lord Chief Justice being quoted by a news source as saying that he was going to replace court interpreters within a few years. With technology, yeah. Yeah, with technology. If you respond to these things in a respectful, helpful way and choose one or two, maybe three organizations to take the lead, you get far more impact. And then the press come back and say, well, you were so useful with this story. Can you come back and tell us about this as well? Absolutely. When they suddenly realize that we're relevant to a whole breadth of things that people hadn't thought about before. So I would advise that we keep our powder dry, especially in public. We allow the, the most affected associations to go and do it and that no one starts making negative comments about Congress, about the subpoena, or about the, the principles involved. Yeah, it's not simply for us to because say. that's not helpful. Yeah. Discuss by all means say it's problematic. Mm. But let the people who are best placed to take over, let them do the job and you'll find that, that we get much more mileage out of this when there's a few people doing the right job. Yeah. But what is helpful, and, and maybe I can say this to, to wrap up this, we, we don't need to go too long with this, but I think what really was helpful for me and, and heartening for me to see was the discussion that was going on in social media among colleagues. So the first time I actually heard about this whole thing was this morning when I just scrolled through my Twitter feed and somebody shared the article and in, almost immediately a discussion sort of evolved and, and a very, well, it was Twitter, but still it was a very civilized and, and a very well-meaning discussion among mm. peers, among interpreters who sometimes have been through similar situations, maybe even not, not quite as bad probably, but through similar dilemmas. And um, nobody spilled the beans, but everybody was kind of in, in this feeling of solidarity and exchanging yeah. and exchanging information. And yeah. Tony Rosado wrote a very interesting, very long and thoughtful article about diplomatic interpreting to provide a bit of um, background and context and i think that really was the the community at its best so i think that's where we should probably best continue this discussion interpreting is interpreting <laughs> exactly <laughs> okay, yeah, for that. That <laughs> that's it for this uh special video uh public service podcast from the troublesome terps maybe more in the future who knows but see know. You next time bye, bye 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 guys bye